Well, good Sabbath, everyone. Pleasure to be with you here and with those listening online. Turn with me today, if you will, to Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. Acts 4, 29 through 31. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now let's give a little context here. What had just happened, Pastor Chris, to these folks before they had this prayer? Uh, they were uh, confronted by the Sanhedrin. Mm-hmm. And they were threatened. And they were told, don't do this anymore. They weren't just peer pressured. They were given direct orders. You do this again, there's going to be consequences. And, of course, they responded along about verse 19 and said, Hey, we got to honor God, you know. Appreciate what you're saying, but no. And then there at the end, um, they went to their own company. So they come back to church in verse 23 and they share all this threats that have gone on and the fact, you know, um, that they were going to be punished if they kept doing that. And it says, when the church, all those gathered there together, heard that, they lifted up their voice to God and they started this prayer. And the prayer goes for several verses, but I, what I wanted to pull out today was what they spoke here in verse 29. Now that you know the context, they said, and now, Lord, look upon their threats. So, look, God, here's what they said. Here's what's going to happen. Notice that they didn't say, and protect us. They didn't say, and deliver us. They didn't say, fix those bad people. What did they pray for? Grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with a boldness. Now, why would they do that? Well, what did Jesus tell them in John 16, 33? Come on, it's my favorite verse. In this world, you will have what? Trouble. Much tribulation. We're not talking about trouble paying your debt. We're not about trouble finding a job. We're talking about persecution. He said, in this world, it's going to happen. So they're not saying, God, deliver us from what you already told us was going to happen. They're saying, God, we're going to keep doing it. That was not a question. But grant that we can do it in spite of their threats. Not only continue to do it, but do it with a boldness. In your face, if you will. Now, we're Americans. We don't like people in our face. It's my space. Get out. But they're saying, grant us the ability to preach the word of God right in people's faces. A boldness. Yeah, you've got spears, but I got God. And I'm going to do what God said. This is their prayer. That's pretty bold, not to be punny, but I mean, think about it. These are people who literally can orchestrate the death of these folks who are praying this, and yet they pray it anyway. God give us even more boldness. But they didn't stop there. They didn't just say, God give us boldness. They're like, oh no. They said, when you give us that boldness, we want you to stretch out your hand to heal and have signs and wonders occur through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So think about it, church. They're not just praying, grant us the ability to be in people's face, but grant us the ability that when we're in people's face, we can come over and touch a shoulder, and it's as new as it was when they were 20. 
Grant us the ability when we see someone that's struggling in a sin that we can come to them and preach the gospel, that we can deliver, preach to them about Jesus and they can repent and confess that sin and not just be forgiven but completely delivered from it. Grant that whenever someone falls out of a window, we can go downstairs and pray over them and they'll come back to life. Grant that when we need direction, that we can hear the Holy Spirit tell us to set up deacons in the church. Grant that the Holy Spirit works in us in such a way that we don't even know what it is. They're just signs. They're wonders that we can't help but know that God is in our midst. Jesus said, even greater works than I do, you will do. But he didn't tell us what they were. I have a hard time mentally getting my mind around that. I mean, he's the son of God, but still, this is what they're praying for. They're not only not worried about the threats, they're not only committed to preaching the gospel, but they're asking God for boldness, and they're asking God for his Holy Spirit to pour out and flow through them to blow people's minds. Are you on the same page with me? Thus the title of our text today. Do you think we should pray like that today? I mean the way they prayed here. This grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Should we be praying for boldness of witness? Should we be praying for God to work signs and wonders through us? Like healing. Sadly, many of us struggle coming to grips with even doing speaking his word. Much less praying for boldness. Are asking God to work miracles through us. And yet it's evident from their prayer. This was not something wrote. This was their earnest desire. God, we have a fire within us to share your word. Give us a boldness to do so and work through us with your Holy Spirit while we're doing it. So, let's assume then that Okay, we know Jesus said we're supposed to witness to all the world, so I'm going to pray for a boldness to do that. Many of us have no problem praying that prayer because we need that. Some of us are introverted and going to talk to somebody and getting in their space and getting in their face and questioning them about where they are spiritually is tough. So we not only see the need to do that, but we also see our own inabilities to do that through our own nature. And so certainly we can pray for boldness. We can pray for boldness. God, give me a courage, a boldness, that it won't matter. That just like those men back then, I won't care. If I lose my job, if I end up getting physically beaten, as we have saw through our Sabbath school studies I am in, that's all a given. Persecution is a given. God, give me the ability to continue to speak with boldness. So we can pray for that. But should we just pray for that? Or should we pray for the signs and wonders too? How about it? Are you ready for God to show up in your life? And all of a sudden, for the first time, you prophesy? Or when you pray for someone to be healed, it happens instantly? That's always a good one. I kind of like that gift. Are you ready to pray for God to work through you? And as we talked about in Sabbath school, see the working of the evil spirits in a person's life and rebuke them as Paul did and command them to go in the name of Jesus. Are you ready to pray for that? They did. Or maybe we need to be like some teachers are, John MacArthur's one famous one that teaches that the signs and wonders 
were specifically designed by God for the purpose of confirming the authority of the apostles and Jesus. And after the apostles did their work in providing the church with a foundation, those signs and wonders ceased. Dispensationalism. And certainly, there are enough stories of spiritual giftings that we've seen out there that turned out to be charlatans just taking people money. They've got some shill out in the crowd that pretends to be a paraplegic, and then they pray over them, and they're magically healed. We know about those stories. And we know there are those who led the church away from the plain statements of Jesus Christ and the apostles to a ministry focused on signs and wonders alone. That's why Paul wrote part of his letter to Corinthian church. It does cause someone to pause, you know. Do I really want to get mixed up in that? You know where I'm going? It, it makes you stop and think. Come on, be real. In fact, John Piper, who you all know I'm a fan of, he talks about this dilemma. He said, I confess that as far as I can remember, there has been no question in all my preaching ministry that it caused me more heart-wrenching uncertainty. I sit at my desk with my head in my hands, and I plead with the Lord. On the one hand, O oh Lord, if there is a wind of true Biblical, spiritual power blowing in our day with signs and wonders and healing and prophecy forbid that I should be the one to stand in the way. And God, please don't pass this church by. Do it here too. Make me the leader you want me to be for the greatest blessing of this church, for the greatest missionary effectiveness. But then on the other hand, I pray, O oh Lord, forbid that we should lose our biblical bearings. Forbid that we become trendy or faddish and begin to substitute the sand of experience for the rock of revealed truth. Show us the fullness of the power of the gospel, Lord, and keep us from preoccupation with secondary things, no matter how spectacular. What a great prayer, huh? I think we could pray that one, right? And so much has been written by evangelical pastors and teachers arguing that the signs and wonders like healings were the sole purpose of helping people recognize and believe in Jesus as the Son of God and then to validate the authority of his apostles as they laid the foundation of the church with their spirit-inspired teachings and writings. These same writers would have us believe that after the apostles died and their writings were gathered up into what we know today as the New Testament, that the place and purpose of signs and wonders was past, and we should not seek them today. Still yet, just as many other books exist, written by evangelical pastors and teachers, who argue that signs and wonders should be sought and performed today in Jesus' name. I am one of those. One thing I think we can all agree on is the reason that we don't see many signs and wonders is because of how little expectancy and yes, maybe even how little desire there is in the church to see God move in and through his people in signs and wonders and healings. You see, Pastor Piper, sorry, got ahead of myself. I believe that God is at work doing a new thing in our day, awakening the church to the reality of these things. I believe that all that God has led Shepherd's Fold Church in over these last few years has been to awaken in us an understanding and then create within us the desire to see all that God has for us be evident within us and within his church. Amen? Piper says we should see more signs and wonders today than we do. And I wholeheartedly agree. Because if you read about these signs and wonders, they're given for the blessing of the church, for the spread of the gospel. And yes, 
I do believe we should be praying the same prayers we find in our text today with the same fervor and the same expectancy that they did back then. There, I've said it. Now let's talk about why. Jesus taught a continuity between his own ministry and the ongoing ministry of the church. John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. What did the Father send Jesus to do? To preach the gospel and to perform signs and wonders. Jesus sent them out for the same purpose and with the same miracle working power that he had. In Luke 9 and verse 2 it says, When Jesus sent out the twelve, he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. You ever notice that last phrase there? I mean, come on, you've read the Bible how many times? Have you ever noticed that Jesus didn't just send them out to preach the gospel? It says, and to heal. Jesus said, there are two kinds of sick people I'm sending you to. People who are sick spiritually, they need to be restored to God. And there are people who as a result of that are sick physically and they need physical healing as well. Go do both of them. Then in Luke 10 and verse 9, when he sent out 70, he commanded them, whenever you enter a town, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. He says, the first thing you do is you heal them. And when they go, wow, you go, you know why that's happened? Because the kingdom of God has come to you. He's here to heal far more than your physical ailments. He's here to heal your soul. Accept Christ as your Savior today. Can you agree with me that the preaching of the kingdom seems to be very closely linked at least with the ministry of healing? We should be praying not only for a boldness to preach, but for God to work through us to heal. And in Matthew 24 and verse 14, Jesus says, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. He said, What I'm telling you to preach is going to preach all over the world, and then the world will end. So the same gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached is to continue to be preached till all the nations have heard it. So we got work to do. And it seems that as we're preaching the kingdom message that Jesus preached, we should be preaching it the same way that Jesus preached it, which included healing. Because we should do what Jesus did, except in those points which he tells us to change, or when some other part of the New Testament tells us to change. For example, we find that after Jesus left, they learned they were to stop limiting preaching the gospel just to the Jews. So they stopped just preaching the gospel only to the Jews. They preached it to everyone who would listen. Because he said to. But guess what? We don't stop allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us with signs and wonders such as healing because no place in the Bible says we were supposed to. John chapter 14 and verse 12. If you're still struggling over where this applies, Jesus said, Truly I say unto you, he who believes in me. Now let's stop there. Notice that there's no end date on that. That is now, tomorrow, the next week, and forevermore. He who believes in me. What? Will also do the works that I do. What should we be doing, church? Do you believe in Jesus Christ today? 
And Jesus said, we're to be doing the same works that he did. Preaching the gospel, healing people, delivering people from evil spirits, whatever the case may be, as the Spirit leads, we obey and do. Expectantly. Expectantly. Not saying, God, that would be nice, or if it's your will, we already just read it's his will. So we pray just like they prayed. God, give us a boldness and work through your signs and wonders and heal people. Deliver people. There is a continuity between the signs and wonders of Jesus and the ministry of those who believe, and it's not just apostles. So the first piece of evidence is that Jesus teaches a continuity between his ministry and the ministry of the church. He does not say, make healing a part of the ministry while I'm here, but not after I'm gone. Scripture does not teach that. The second piece of evidence is the fact in the book of Acts, it's not just the apostles who do signs and wonders. Did you know that? Two deacons. Now deacons are, in the Bible are not necessarily the deacons we have in our churches today. These deacons were created to be servants. There were problems with who got fed and who got ministered to and it was creating trouble. The apostles said, look, we're still trying to wrap our mind on these Old Testament things and how they fit with Jesus' ministry and we really need to stay focused on that. God, what should we do? And the Spirit told them to appoint these people that they called deacons, servants, to handle those matters of making sure people's physical needs were taken care of. So in our convoluted human mind, we might place that as a lesser role, right? These people are all spiritual, doing that stuff, and these people are just handling day-to-day -day needs. God didn't seem to see it that way. We read in the books of Acts, in chapter 6, that Stephen and Philip also do signs and wonders as a part of their ministry. Let's look at them for a moment. In Acts 6 and verse 8, Luke says, Stephen, full of grace and power did great wonders and signs among the people. He's coming to bring this widow or this orphan food. Maybe they're sick or whatever. And he heals right there at the same time. He goes to minister to this family who's without a job. And he sees that one of them is possessed with an evil spirit and delivers them. Obviously, that's not in Scripture, but you get the point. He did signs and wonders, things that people could not help but know that it was God doing. But he's just a lowly deacon. And then in Acts in verse 8, verse 6, it says, And the multitudes, so crowds, with one accord, gave heed to what was said by Philip. They didn't just listen, they acted on it. When they heard him and saw the signs which he did. What makes Philip's ministry to the Samaritans so interesting is that it's only later that the apostles came down and laid hands on the Samaritans. This means that Philip was not acting somehow in the place of an apostle when he did the signs and wonders. He simply had sign-working power as a part of its evangelical ministry. Ponder on that for a moment. The third piece of evidence is found in Galatians 3 and verse 5 where Paul writes to the churches of Galatia and says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now he's making another point here about whether it's by the hearing of faith or by the law, but in so doing, he reveals what's going on in the Galatian church. God is supplying the Spirit to them and working miracles among them to the church, the body. And oh, by the way, he's doing it while Paul's not there. That's why he had to write the letter. 
So the working of the miracles does not seem to be limited to the ministry of the apostles in the earlier church. The preaching of the gospel with boldness does not seem to be limited to the apostles in the early church. Finally, the fourth piece of evidence is found in 1 Corinthians 12, which I preached on last when you heard me, where Paul teaches that in the church there were gifts of healings and miracles for various believers and not just for the apostles, for he listed that first. Do you remember that? All those things he listed. He says in verse 7 through 10, he said, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Anybody here a grammar geek? What's that mean there when he says to each? I'm not sure those in the back heard you. Can you say that again a little louder? Everybody. Everybody is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Not so they're built up, but for what? He goes on to say for what? For the common good. Everyone has some gift of the Spirit that God gives them for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the gifts of healing. To another, workings of miracles. Then in verse 28, he distinguishes this from the apostolate. When he says, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings. So if they're in that list, you know, albeit not the first, but they're in that same list with apostles, it seems pretty clear that there were gifts of healings and miracles that weren't just limited to the apostles, or he would have just said there are apostles. Amen? So for reasons like these, I believe that signs and wonders were not limited to the apostles or to that age, but are available for us today. And I believe and I charge you that they should be sought for the good of the church and for the spread of the gospel. So in closing, let's go back to our passage today where they prayed not only for boldness to continue doing what they were already doing, despite all that was going on, but to do so with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for signs and wonders. I believe with all my heart we should pray like that today. What about you? So many are suffering. So many are in the need of the message of the gospel to transform their lives and deliver them from the bondage of sin, from demonic possession. Still others, like our dear sister Faye in the hospital or Mr. Bill can find a home who are in desperate need of healing physically. Don't we want that for everyone who's sick and suffering? I mean, some of us are in the field for that very purpose. So to that end, the answer to today's sermon title is yes. We should be praying like that today. We should be praying for a boldness to preach and for God to heal. And we should be praying so with a great fervor and expectancy. Granted, we need to honor the uniqueness of Jesus and the apostles and that revelatory moment in history that gave us our foundational doctrines of faith and life in the New Testament. I charge you today, we must also be open to the reality that based on God's word, today, right now, this too is a unique moment in history. Think about it, church. In this moment, right here, right now, it may well be God's purpose to pour out His Spirit in an unprecedented revival. A revival of love to Christ and a zeal for worship and a compassion for lost people and a missionary thrust that is accompanied by signs and wonders. Won't you today begin to pray with me this prayer that the early church prayed? Amen.